Uh, so we're going to play the we're going to simulate a pick six game. Woo! So the, this is to simulate the Arizona pick six, and so what we need is uh, six numbers, one through forty-four. What what should we play? Seven. Give me a number. Seven. All right. Hold on. Seven. And 13. sorry. Thirteen. Thirteen. Favorite number. Okay. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Twenty-one. Twenty-three. Forty-three. Thirty-one. And thirty-one. Okay. Now we've got our six numbers. And the nice thing about the simulator is it, it it'll play repeatedly, quite rapidly. And it's to simulate the two drawings a week in, in uh, the pick the pick game in Arizona draws Wednesday night and Saturday night, so two times a week. And it's a dollar a play. Uh, if you mat if we match three numbers, we're gonna win, as it says here, we're gonna win three dollars. If we match four numbers, we're gonna win fifty dollars. And if we match five out of six, we're gonna win two thousand. And if we match all six, today's payout, I just checked it, is one point three million dollars. So that's what we're playing for. And so if I press start play, we will see it play pretty rapidly. Uh, so you can see now we've played for four, five years, six years, seven years, and you can see how many we're hitting. So after 10 years, we've hit 21 three out of sixes. Okay, so this is how the simulator works. <laughs> All right, so now it's been 22 years and we've hit 51 three out of sixes. Well, we did get two four out of sixes. Uh, oh, yep, there we go, okay. So, <laughs> and the nice thing about the simulator is that it tells you how much we wager. So we wagered $4,000 so far, and how much, based on how much we've won, we've actually got a net loss so far. After 50 years, we've got a net loss of about $5,000, right? So that's the simulator. I'm just gonna check on this maybe once in a while, let it run in the background, because it might be fun to see, to see how we're doing, okay? Now. Um, here's what we're going to do today. Uh, this is going to be what is sometimes called uh, a case-based reasoning approach to applied ethics. And that is instead of starting with some complicated ethical theory, and we have them and we like to use them, and uh, we're, instead we're going to start off with a real practical, sort of in-your-face, concrete example of real-life ethics a real life situation that we can consider in an ethical framework. And so what we want to do is, uh, is talk about this situation and, tr and try to figure out what are the important moral implications. And when I say moral, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a real simple definition of that. And I'm just going to say that moral will mean in this case, for our purposes today, it'll mean that it, uh, is there an extra share somewhere? Means that, right there, means that it will help or hurt somebody. So what I want to focus on is, and, and when I talk to my students about this, I, I say it's important when you think about ethics, to think about ethics is not just how things go bad, but also how they can go well. And so ethics always is looking at the two sides, what's good, what's bad, what's beneficial, what's harmful. And so we want to consider this case, in this particular case, this case, in terms of both the good and the bad. And hence, I've got my recorders. I've got two people, what's your name? Alex. Alex and Emily. Emily. And, my, and I've got, and Emily's my frowny face person, and um, Alex is my happy face person, and they're gonna help us record what we've come up with for pros and cons for this particular situation that we've decided to explore today, which is the state-run lottery. And I chose that as a, t as a good sort of real life concrete situation to talk about in terms of case-based ethics because it's it's a uh, it's a ubiquitous part of our society it's unavoidable it's the main message we actually get from our state government um, on a daily basis is that we should play the lottery so it's it's and it's in the background so it's not something that we really think about a lot in terms of, there's some chairs over there, in terms, of, uh, in terms of ethics. And so I thought it would be fun to take this as an example of maybe trying to look at what insights we can find from this, and then maybe what, what insights we could generalize to, uh, to, to, uh, to other cases. So you might be wondering how we're doing. All right, so we've played 90 years, and so far the best we've done is 11. Uh, four out of four. So we've so far after 100 years, we've lost nine thousand dollars. Okay. 
we'll check on that later. This is not, it, it, even though this seems like this is a lecture because I'm lecturing right now, it's, it's not what this is about because uh, really the other advantage of case-based reasoning is it really sucks for lecturing. And it's really, it's, it really lends itself to a discussion. And so that's what we're going to be doing. But before we do that, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit uh, by telling you a little bit about the lottery. Um, let's just start this up. I find this really interesting in that the lottery is a relatively new phenomenon in American life. And um, what's interesting is back in, the, um, back in the colonial days, it was actually very prevalent. Uh, lotteries, private lotteries, not state lotteries, but private lotteries were going on all the time. People would have an expensive thing they wanted to sell, like property or a house. And the, because people didn't have a lot of money, the best way to sell it would be to sell raffle tickets. And, um, and, and that would be the way to get to transfer property in a way that was affordable to people. So that happened all the time. Then the colonial governments, sometime in the in the 1700s decided that um, this was so lucrative that they decided they were going to take it over entirely and they basically outlawed private lotteries and took it over themselves. Uh, we, we were kind of, uh, this country was born with a lottery mentality because the, the Brits love lottery and so we inherited that basically from the Brits. Uh, now, of course, when, they were, when, the, when England was trying to uh, sort of crush the, the colonial uprising, they decided to take this tool for raising money away from the colonies. And so they outlawed the lottery, the state-run lotteries, our colonial-run lotteries. Then, when, when the, the revolution happens, the, all the colonies uh, started running their lotteries again because it was a way to raise money for uh, their armies and for other public purposes. And so we have a long history in this country of raising money through lotteries for public purposes. Uh, however, there was a backlash against this. And the backlash came from t basically uh, two different arguments. The first argument was it was unfair. It was, it was unfair that people got something for nothing. So this is a real Puritan idea that uh, it's, it's just not fair that I'm working hard in life and then my neighbor goes and buys a ticket and becomes wealthy. So that's, that was one argument against the lottery. And the other argument against the lottery was that it was ripe for fraud. That there were all sorts of fraudulent activities going on in these early lotteries and people were getting screwed all the time. So these were the two arguments against it, and they actually started winning out to the point where uh, in the early 1800s, by 1830 or so, lotteries were basically outlawed across the country. And there were a couple exceptions to that. Uh, one exception, and the most prominent exception, was in Louisiana, where that lottery actually thrived into uh, the late 1800s, and it only died in 1907. And then from 1907 until 1963, there were no lotteries in this country. And the, the one exception was in Alaska, in Alaska, where since 1917, they've had a lottery based on wh uh, when the ice on a particular river is going to melt. That's the only lottery they still have, by the way, in, in Alaska. <laughs> so everybody once a year bets on when the I, I think they have a truck sitting on the ice or something, and then the, the day it falls through is when the, the, what the, you know, how they select the winner. And so that's win, And you win the truck. Yeah, you win a wet truck, exactly. So Alaska. But um, yeah, I just took that from my friend here, Alex. So uh, yeah, anyway, so New Hampshire was having a real problem back in the 60s because they don't have state uh, income tax and they don't have uh, sales tax. And so they were having <laughs> severe budget problems and they thought, well, what about a lottery? So in 1964, they implement a lottery and it's basically a two drawings a year kind of a lottery. So it's sort of a half hearted attempt to get into the lottery business. They started off, and then, and then what happens? 1965, 60, oh, uh, 1967, Massachusetts joins. Uh, and then New York joins in 1971. And now there's, uh, these states are starting to run it in a, in a more systematic way with, with more drawings. But basically, they're not pushing the lottery. They're just offering it for people who maybe would have played illegal numbers games anyway. Because one thing I failed to mention is that when the lottery became illegal across the country, people didn't stop gambling. 
It, they just turn to uh, basically organized crime uh, and mob run numbers games. So, lottery, so illegal number games were rampant across the country. So here's the idea that you can provide a legitimate game and make law-abiding citizens out of people who are otherwise going to bet. All right, so what's going on? 72, you can see it's starting to spread now. You've got things like scratcher tickets have been implemented and people realize that bigger payouts are uh, attracting. Uh, so it was sometime in the 70s that New York offered the first million dollar winner. And then you've got more expansion, 75. And it's not long before, let's join Connecticut. Boom. So now the entire east, uh, Northeast is, uh, has lotteries. And that funny state in the West. And then we keep adding states, adding more and more. And it's just spreading and spreading. And 2006, 7, 8, and then just last year, boom, Wyoming. So this is the current state of, <coughs> of affairs in this country. You can see the, it's fun just to run through that rapidly, because you can see how, since, uh, starting in 1963, how, how this thing just spreads across the country. Is it weird that Nevada doesn't have a lottery? Not at all. Uh, why, wouldn't lot, why wouldn't Nevada have a lottery? Gambling. gambling the, 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 the gaming industry is a super strong uh, industry in that, uh, in that state, and they would never want competition from the state. So, and by the way, Mississippi, mm -hmm. same deal. And, um, and Alabama, it's more, the, the last states actually to get, to get on the bandwagon were Bible Belt states. And um, they had strong religious objections to, to gambling. And Alabama, that is still the reason that Alabama doesn't have uh, gambling. And guess what other state you might put in that category? Utah. Exactly. So uh, uh, the Mormon Church uh, specifically does not approve of gambling, uh, which is interesting because you go to Nevada and most of the people dealing your cards are Mormons. So I mean, there's a the, yeah the the the, uh, the gaming industry trusts uh, Mormon dealers. You know, so that's and they're not that's no. and they're not gambling. That's right. Uh, Alaska, we already talked about. They they have traditionally have not had the problem that New Hampshire had because they've been rolling in money with the oil industry, uh, with the oil revenues for the state. So they have never really had that kind of pressure. Um, and Hawaii is another one that is resisted. And again, because of industry pressure, and this time the tourism industry, they they felt that it would compete with the with the, the tourist dollar. So that you know, we can kind of explain why. Uh, and maybe predict that this will be the state of affairs for a long, long, long time to come now, um, unless Alabama folds. But probably, given the, pre the, pre the pressures. Um, and, so, and you don't see any states backing out? No. Yeah, well, we can talk about that. But, but um, one of the reason that they don't is because of the huge amount. Thank you for You're that, welcome. by the way. Uh, is because of the huge amount of revenue. Now we're talking about a net, um, a gross. Uh, hall here of seventy billion dollars across the states, and so how much of that actually goes into the state budget? Uh, well, let's do this first. Uh, so, do, if we just do a simple math and figure out per household, that means that each household in the U.S. is spending five hundred sixty-eight dollars a year on the lottery. And I did a little back of the napkin calculation to figure out how many low income, how much per low income household that was, and that's uh, and because. We can talk about this, but low-income households are more likely to pay, play the state lottery, and so the number is higher. It's something like eight to nine hundred dollars per low-income household um, that's spending. Yes. Now, do you think that's because um, the state lotteries kind of market themselves as financial planning for the poor? We can talk about that, and that's <laughs> very interesting. Uh, okay. There's another one. Oh yeah. You may have. Well, this is just a relatively new phenomenon where, and Illinois is the prominent example of this, where they basically, it's a really messed up state politically and budgetarily, and they can't raise the money that they need. They could, they, and so they've been stealing from the lottery fund in order to 
uh, pay their current accounts, and which means that they've had to tell lottery winners that they can't have their winnings. So yeah, that's a whole different if, amazing story. Because if you're trying to incentivize people to play this game, which is a big part of, of this operation, then it's uh, telling them that you're not actually paying your winners. I mean, a big part of winning is you got that person on TV with the big check. That's how you get the next person to play. Uh, anyway. Uh, how much of that $70 billion did they give back? Oh, thank you. <laughs> $20 billion. So $20 billion, it goes is net revenue to the states. Proceeds to the states after payouts, and this is after expenses. So this is actually money that goes right into the state budget. That's after they pay their expenses. It's a lot, right? It's almost equivalent to the entire combined revenue of the three major sports in our country. That's how big that number is. All right. So that's kind of just, oh. Yes. Just for my personal clarification, that twenty billion is across the entire United States. Well, it, with the exception of the it, with the exception of the states that aren't oh, playing. Of course. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't like a couple of individual states. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how much states are raising in um, No, I don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this varies from state to state, obviously, because, um, for example. Texas has no income tax, and they raise it all through property tax. So I, yeah, I'm not sure uh, how this varies from state to state. Mary? So what percentage of expenses do they have? So what is the net return to the lottery player? It's about, it's about I think, um, uh, that's a good question, because I actually ran across that when I was doing our research for this today. And it's something like 70% goes to the player which is a really bad investment. That means that if you played the lottery forever, you'd get 70 cents on your dollar. But that's approximately what, what it is. You know, this is what you stand up in front of a group and you say something with confidence, and people are supposed to accept it. So, uh, so. It's hard to believe you get a billion profit out of 70, and then you get percent back. All right, let me just say, this is an exercise for the. Well, no, the 70, I'm sorry, the 70% would be out of the 50. All right, let's just stop this conversation. <laughs> this is going to be, we all have Google, people. All right, so, um, so I'm going to say it's a bad investment. If this is how you're investing your money, then maybe it's a bad investment. That's all I'm going to suggest to you. Oh, OK, so that was, this is actually my entire setup for our discussion. And, I, and so what I wanted to do then with that knowledge, the idea it's relatively new, that we completely considered inappropriate just illegitimate, and then in the last number of years, we've all of a sudden considered it just to be background noise, and, kind of, and we've all accepted it, with the exception of a few states, then it's so fascinating. How did we get from the, to that point? And do we really think about the pros and cons uh, of the lottery? So let me do one more thing. And this is, is just during your, during your lifetime, right? Shh. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it actually is. I was born before there were any lotteries. Um, here are we doing? Okay, 187 years. We've now run four out of six, 24 times. Okay, we're almost getting to 200 years. 200 years. 200 years. We've lost 18,000 dollars. Okay. So that's playing only one ticket each time. That's <laughs> playing one ticket with the same numbers, but still doing that, it's almost statistically impossible. How so? Just looking, just going off the simulator. Well, yeah. Well, it's not. Uh, it's not impossible. There are odds. There, are easy, you can use it. You can. I, I, we can. If we had time, I would show you exactly how to calculate the odds of a six-number game, and uh, we'll talk about the odds in a minute. But uh, they're not good. They're not good. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> they're not good. More winners with less money if they were better. Exactly. All right. So we have a good amount of time now to, to kind of discuss, uh, and I'm and and so what I'd like to do is just ask you this question, which is. Uh, what are the pros and cons of the lottery? And then I have my two, my two assistants here who are going to just write up the happy and the, and the frowny face. And, um, and so what do you think? Because uh, when we think about this as, a, as a, uh, an ethical consideration, we think that there's good and bad about it. And then eventually we want to figure out how we balance those out. OK, it's on you now. Entertainment value? Enter happy face? What? <laughs> 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 Well, if you would, that would be that would be okay too. Okay. 
and read uh, his role. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so OK, so entertainment, it, it definitely. Uh, I've heard that most of our education budget comes from the lottery. All right, so it helps fund education. And oh, is that true, by the way? Uh, I'm looking that up right now. Well, in Florida, it pays for everybody to go to college. Exactly. New Mexico. Too. New Mexico and uh, I think it's another state. Georgia, Georgia, Florida, New Mexico, right? Those three states have kind of a lockbox situation where the, the lottery revenue must go to scholarships. And you really won't find any states, by, by, by the way, that aren't bragging about how their lottery funds are going to fund education or senior citizens or whatever. But what's, of course, interesting about that is uh, it creates a great opportunity for uh, a shell game, which is that money comes in uh, to the state revenue designated for education, and then the legislature can just take the money otherwise that would have been de for education. So, th so what we find is that education budgets don't go up with state lottery, uh, with state lottery states, that they're not different. And, that, and so what they're doing is moving this money elsewhere. I think that's in Georgia too. It's uh, if, so you have to graduate from a Georgia high school. Yeah. It might be in the same way in Florida too. Um, and that so that you can see how that's a little different because they're actually giving to scholarships, and so they're not so they're not defunding the, the University of New Mexico. Uh, what they're doing is giving kids scholarships. So that that's a little bit tighter connection between lottery revenue and education. But in most states, it's pretty weak. But maybe I should show you a little video. I'll get to you in a second, Matthew. Uh, okay. Yeah, I wonder if I have sound. I don't have sound, damn it. Okay, just a mat. And, and so this kind of feel-good marketing is going on in every state where you actually, so you, know, you will actually be helping out the state in, the, in these very important programs, but then somebody will point out that you actually aren't because it's not increasing the budget for these items. It's actually just allowing the state not to increase taxes to fund them. So With a disproportionate burden on low-income households. Trying face? Yeah, and that's something that I tried to emphasize with the stats before is that, um, and why is that a disproportionate burden on low-income households? But it's, it's doubly uh, disproportionate because they make less money, but they spend more, right? So they spend a much higher percent of their, of their household income on the lottery than a rich person does who's spending, let's say, $500 a year. A, a poor household spending $800 a year, that's a significant part of the budget. And of course, that's an average because you have to figure out there's some many households, uh, let's say half of the low income households are spending zero on the lottery. So you have to say that the, it's, I have a misleading number there because that's an average number yeah. and I really should be showing you some kind of median. Yeah, Matthew. So just going back to the funds education thing, kind of what you were saying, I have the actual breakdown on the state's website for their lottery right here. For which state? Arizona. Okay. So apparently, last fiscal year, 175 million was raised from the lottery. Now, this is apparently just a complete shell game. Uh, 84.5 million went to education. 66, 65.5 million went to health and human services. 10.5 million went to the environment. Uh, those are world haters. And 14.5 million went to economic and business development. Mm -hmm. So it. it but if they're doing this, aren't they just uh, moving money around? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. 100%, because uh, otherwise you would see that in lottery states there would be more spending on these items than in non-lottery states, and that is not the, f uh, that is not the case. Lower taxes is a benefit too. Lower ta oh, smiley face? <laughs> so, you can... Ships and tax burden. Uh, frowny face. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it's, a, it's kind of there already, but it's actually, a, it's actually a more nuanced point than the point you made earlier because, uh, you're welcome, because uh, there's a lot of talk about how 
um, especially among wealthy people, about how it's unfair that they're carrying a, um, a disproportionate burden of, the, um, of funding our society. That they feel it's unfair to basically shift uh, uh, the cost burden from low-income people to high-income people. And what we have to recognize is that this is actually the exact opposite, that our state services are being funded more by the poor in this case than, and then people say, well, that's only fair. The poor have gotten away for so much for so long. All right, that was ironic. All right. <laughs> you know. But it is voluntary to play the lottery. Oh, voluntary wait, voluntary? Okay, voluntary. Is that a happy but, thing? That's a happy thing, right? Voluntary? I would say so. Yeah, you know, okay. It's not like that uh, well, short story where you play and then you, if you get drawn, you get killed. Exactly. <laughs> One of the best short stories ever. Right. Yes. Mary? Um, so one of the other things that uh, disproportionately affects the poor is the chances are their property taxes or income taxes would not have gone up to fund these programs regardless because many of them would not be affected by uh, property tax. So Well, and, and so this actually... So they're, they're paying what they might have had to pay should their property tax have gone up, but if they had no property, they may not have funded it anyway. So they are funding yeah. And so you, I guess you, it depends upon your ideology and perspective, because some people will see this as a positive thing, that they, they'll say there's no other way to get the poor to chip in for all these things that they're using. There's no other way. You can't get them with property taxes. You, they don't buy a lot, so you can't get them with uh, sales tax. They don't have a lot of income, so you can't get them. With, but here's a way to get them. And, and then other people will say, well, that's, that's a crazy reasoning. They, the reason they're poor is because, you know, anyway. So um, it could go in either happy or, smart, or frowny. <laughs> yes. Depends on your ideology. Um, it's seen as the only net, uh, the only way for social mobility, like advertised by government. Okay, to, uh, so is that a is that a good thing or a bad thing? A uh, bad thing, because it's because it's see, a lot of poor people invest in it because they see it as their only option for uh, social and financial mobility. Okay, uh, I actually think this is a really interesting point because. Um, so I'm a dyed-in-the-wool capitalist. I think it's, uh, in spite of the failings of the system, I think it's the best way to create the best amount of value for everybody. And that, of course, there has to be checks and balances on that. And I, and I, and I would argue that the state lottery is an anti-capitalist idea. Because you're basically saying to people uh, that the way to get ahead in life is not necessarily to work hard, uh, better yourself, make sure your kids have a good education, but to, but to but basically, to just be happy with your crappy life until you can get out of it by buying a lottery ticket. So it's, it's sort of a, 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 that's the way I think about it. So that's a frowning face for me. Uh, so what's the, what's the short version of that? Rags to rags. <laughs> rags to rags. Now, would it also decrease savings rates? Um, well, that's actually an empirical question, and I don't know. But, but, but one could, might be able to predict that. That's interesting. Yeah. We, ha we, have, we can seat you if you want to come in. We have a couple of <coughs> chairs. No, you just want to lurk? That's, That's fine. One at the table. Okay. There's a ta one at the table. You have a seat at the table. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we talked about the lottery as being uh, like an entertainment thing. Yes. Right, but it's an entertainment thing that provides a public good. And if we're talking about, uh, like, we'll say the pick six, because that's what we're running simulations on. Right. And it costs a dollar to play. Yeah. It's cheaper to play the lottery seven days a week than it is to go to Starbucks twice a week. So it's a cheap form of entertainment? Unless you buy a lot of tickets, right? Well, right, but what I'm saying is, is that like, the, the game inherently is not gonna take, like, we need to look at, before we say it's a disproportionate bur burden on the poor, yeah, it shouldn't be marketed as financial planning because the odds are terrible. Yeah. But as a form of entertainment, I mean, we, we should see it the relative expenditure of low-income households on other forms of entertainment, like movies or video games or uh -huh. you know, vacations or anything else, and compare that to their expenditures on the lottery and see uh -huh. if they're really spending that much on it. Like, is it actually harming them, or is it just something people do for fun? Well, OK, so we don't actually know that, I don't think. I, as far as I know, I haven't found anybody who's actually done that particular study. And I'm just going to go for it with more of a common sense approach, which is I, when I look at the how per household spending per poor family, that I'm going to say it um, I, I would say the same thing if I saw that they were that they were uh, 
spending $850 on anything that wasn't sort of related to food and housing, and especially for a poor family, the basic. So I, so, but, but allowing for the fact that people make entertainment dollar choices, then, the, then we have an interesting overlay on this, which is the state is not saying, go to the movies, go to the movies, go to the movies. They're not, that's not the message you hear from the state every day. The state is telling you every day, repeatedly, on the radio, on TV, on billboards, buy lottery tickets. And so, that, so it's, um, uh, it's not simply just providing a choice, but it's pushing, pushing it. Can, can you check and see where we are? I think we might have won. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Nope. Nope. All right, so it's been 284 years, and we've got 36 officers, and we've lost $26,000. I have a clock that says we, don't, we break 1,000 before it went 1,000 years. Yeah. All right, there were some comments over there. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so I guess one of your cons, based on what you said, could be that if it, it facilitates gambling addiction amongst the people of the states, because if they're constantly pushing this imagery of, you know, play the lottery, you know, win big, you know, you'll be rich and set for life. Yeah. They're well, basically turning to addicts, and like that little disclaimer, you know, for the gambling addiction hotline on the back that you need yeah. you know, a magnifying glass to read, it isn't doing nothing for no one. So uh, for, for people who ha have a propensity toward o o o sort of overindulging in, in uh, games of chance, it certainly, the, for the idea that the state pushing it all the time would it certainly aggravate that, right? That, so that's definitely, a, that's got to be a con. Especially if you just like it. Well, and and we should point out, given exactly that point, that it's relatively easy to win, uh, uh, relatively easy to win one out of six and to get us a three dollar payoff. And but don't you, don't, you have to get three out of six to get three dollars. I'm sorry, is that what, I didn't say that. Uh, I said one out of six. I'm sorry, three out of six. Uh, yeah, three out of six gets the three dollars. And by the way, they know what you're going to do with your three dollars. So, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> You know, so that basically isn't going to be, uh, you're never going to walk home with that. You're going to buy three more tickets. And, um, or, but, uh, and some of these tickets are $5 and $10 tickets, by the way. The, the, not this one, but, uh, so this is only one game I'm showing you. But if you look at the scratcher tickets, now you're talking about $5 and $10 tickets. And people are sp spending real money on this kind of thing. Uh, oh, OK. So others? Yeah. Uh, other bad habits. Uh, you go to store to buy a lot of lottery tickets. Like usually it's a convenience store. You're yeah. Buy smokes and, okay. and alcohol. So it might be promoted or associated or junk food. But uh, on the other, if we make a positive out of this, if, if convenience stores love the lottery because it drives traffic. And so it actually is really, really good for business. You take away the lottery from convenience stores, and they are going to have serious problems. Not only that, they have a chance to win because uh, when, a, when a store ha sells a winning ticket, then they get a big bonus, like $30,000 or something. So that's really, really helpful for the stores. And of course, they have a much better chance of winning than you do as an individual because they're selling a lot of tickets to a lot of different people. So for business, it's really nice. But convenience stores aren't really good for the poor people either because it's more expensive. And well, I, I would, think that's... I that's bet that poor people uh, buy more in convenience stores than in Walmart or where, where Yeah, and so and I think that's your point, right? That you're sort of... You're bringing them to a stuff they shouldn't be buying, cigarettes, alcohol, and crappy food. So that can't be good. Yeah. But using that logic, wouldn't other companies also have a stake in the lottery? Hey, I'm going to the convenience store buying a lottery ticket. Oh, I'm seeing a bunch of other products I might want. You know, surrounded well, that's why, the convenient, yeah. that's why the convenience stores love it. And so we have to put that on the positive side. It's really, really good $1 for, for these small, purchase. these generally a lot of small business people, you know, and, and of course big chains too. But that, but it's it's good for it's good for those businesses, no doubt. So I think it was Quick Trip, maybe a year or so ago, decided that they wouldn't take uh, debit cards for lottery tickets. Is that right? Circle K still does. Yeah. But Interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I heard an anecdote, and I haven't really been able to find it factually yet, but um, which is that if you uh, that there are a percentage of people who are treating the lottery as a retirement plan. Uh, and it's a very small percentage, but they're actually buying tickets because that's how they're going to get they're going to retire. And not, not, I'm talking about immediate retirement, but they're thinking about their long-term future instead of instead of stocking money away. 
um, in, a, in a bank account, they're thinking, this is my plan. So that can't be good. Is that right? Uh, other, th other thoughts? And that's why he's 75 and not retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, let me inspire you by showing you another uh, lottery commercial. Oh, let's see how we did. It's almost 700 years. Oh, we won five out of six. Yeah, but we've lost sixty thousand dollars. That's the downside. But we made two thousand. Exactly. <laughs> Over six hundred years. Right. Yeah. Well, you know. All right. So this is. You've seen this one a lot now. This lottery hall of fame. Uh, There's a couple of things about that commercial that I this find interesting. Moderately misleading. Well, so how so? Well, it certainly is true that you can't win if you can't play that. But that, yes, that's true. Very truthful statement. It's Absolutely. true, except I, I always point out that with that statement, it's, it's practically equivalent to the opposite statement, which is you can't win if you do play. It's <laughs> that the that the that the um, the similarity between those statements is so close that for practical purposes, it's, it's not even valid, and so um, and. Uh, so that's one thing I'd say. What else about well, that? That's kind of what I was getting at. If you look at the astronomical odds of winning, you know, the 10,000, 2,000, whatever, um, as we saw 600 years of playing once a day, you finally win $2,000. Right. Thousands win every day. I'm pretty sure, well, I'm going to use a little bit of what I would assume is common sense. I assume that most of that is one in three dollar, you know, yeah. wins. Right. Well, that's why that's why they say thousands win a day, and it's it's one or two or three dollars yeah, depending it's on the not game. What they're displaying as right. large win. Like and large and by the way, if, it's fun to look on um, on YouTube and look at all the different lottery commercials across the country, which um, I've got I've got, but I'm not going to show you today. But um, but usually a very predominant feature in lottery commercials is overemphasizing winning. There's one. There's a pick six commercial from New Jersey where. Two people in two in, in one office environment. Two people win within minutes each of, of each other. And this is why this is what lottery commercials are always doing. They're showing you that people are winning all the time. So they're not showing you the stadiums full of people who bought a ticket and didn't get anything or got just enough to buy another ticket. They're showing you these cases where and and overemphasizing the likelihood that you'll be a winner. Speaking of the stadiums and losers, uh, when that commercial <laughs> was running, I, I thought you know this girl probably has a better chance of being selected. Going to a basketball game, every home game for the season, getting mm -hmm. selected to take the half court shot and winning ten thousand yeah. dollars. Girls are probably much higher doing that than playing the market. Well, I don't know if you guys ever go to like the Diamondbacks game or the Coyotes game or something and do the fifty fifty raffle. But um, you have about a one out of twenty thousand chance of winning that raffle. And I'm I'm gonna say you are not gonna win that raffle, right? Most people are not gonna win that raffle. Now we're talking about when you're talking about a game like this, like this game. So if you're not going to win that, so just one of the things I want to emphasize is that even smart, well-educated people have a hard time wrapping their heads around these probabilities. And, so, and that's why it's particularly pernicious for the poor because, uh, and less educated because if the best educated people in our country have a hard time wrapping their minds around these probabilities, then it's kind of a hopeless cause for people who haven't really th th thought this out. So I want to throw back at you one quick thing, though, which is that 50-50 draws are a different kind of beast in the sense that you know exactly where the charitable donation is going to go. So 50% yeah. goes to the winner and 50% goes to the charity right. hosting it, blah, blah, blah. So I mean, there's that element of it. And plus, somebody in that room that you're in is going to win that night. So things are a little yes. bit different there. That said, why shouldn't I play the 50-50 when I go to the Coyotes game? Well, you should. And, and uh, I'm just saying don't expect to win. Uh, so it's a donation, and and actually, okay, that's okay. and notice how I've separated. I've, I've intentionally separated out all other forms of gambling in our society because there are many of them. And I, and even though I did introduce that 50/50, which is a charity or raffle, uh, as an example of how probabilities are hard to grasp, uh, I'm, I'm leaving out this discussion, and I'm leaving out the the um, 
uh, the Nevada gambling industry and the, and the Native American gambling industry. I'm really interested here in the extra layer of ethical consideration to have the state government pushing this game. And that, in, that in, in other words, we, we are doing this to ourselves. And so um, that, I, I like that as an extra la layer. Oh, 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 okay, so uh, if you, twice. If, we're doing great. We've only lost $70,000 in 835 years. So, uh, I, um, uh, oh, oh, so I, I can do the math with you, but, uh, but we don't have time for that. But if I did, you'd see that our odds of, of getting, hitting six out of six is um, about 7.1 million out of one. So every seven, seven. seven million, <laughs> not billion, seven million. How many zeros? Uh, mm -hmm. I, get, I, I guarantee it's a million. There is uh, nine. That's billion. I know, but you did the math wrong then, because it's seven. <laughs> Look. Oh! <laughs> what are the odds that you did the math wrong? One hundred percent. It's about it's about one out of it's about one out of seven million times. You look it up on the on the if you have the internet, look it up on the uh, Pick Six Lottery site. They'll tell you the odds. Why should we believe that? They They're lying about, about the. <laughs> 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 They're They're That's a good question. They're putting a shell game on their. And website. by the way, so, so let me just let me just expand on that point because it's really an interesting point because um, the state traditionally is a regulator. That's what we expect the state to do is to protect us, to watch out, to make sure that we don't take, get taken advantage of. And in this one instance in life, they are also the purveyor of a game that exploits people. So and. So we're, they're playing two roles now. They're playing the regulator role and they're playing the exploiter role, which is a really challenging juxtaposition. Uh, so anyway, one out of 7.2 million, I'll, go, I'll, I'll take one zero away from you, and, um, and suggest to you that if I sent you to the store, to the convenience store with $100,000, which is what we spent so far, and told you to buy lottery tickets, the average person would think, I have a pretty good chance of winning, right? But when you look at the odds, when you look at the odds of one out of seven million, you have a really, really bad chance of winning. That $100,000 expenditure hardly moved the needle for you. And that's really hard for us to grasp, right? So I've run this simulation uh, with my students uh, over the years now, and I've only one time, uh, I even ran it overnight once and uh, I only hit one time the, the jackpot. So it just, and, that, and that's, numbers, but, though, right? but that's entirely right. predictable. Clearly we just picked the wrong numbers. Exactly, we picked the wrong numbers. And by the way, uh, so when I was uh, poking around uh, on Google in preparation for today, one of the things I found was a, um, a book you can buy on strategies for winning the lottery. And, um, and this is basically how you pick the right numbers. And this is, again, a uh, uh, complete misunderstanding of how probability works. Because the, sticking with the same six numbers for, uh, for 1,000 years is exactly equivalent if we changed our numbers every time. Or if we, I mean, the strategies like pick the numbers nobody plays, because those are more likely to come up. I mean, this is just a complete misunderstanding of math, right? <laughs> and so, um, really, and, but, but, but by the way, but, but this makes sense to people who, and, that, and that's why sometimes you hear it called a, a tax on mathematically illiterate, uh, uh, because people, but that's really unfair to me, because I would say that in a sense we are all, we all share that as human beings. We share that illiteracy in understanding these probabilities, right? All except mathematicians. Thank you. But I don't think it's just By the way, uh, smiley person, yes. Alex, please put hope up there because hope is a really nice thing to have in life, especially if you if your straights in life are not good, and so it and hope. So entertainment was at the top for me. It's entertainment. I don't really. It won't really change my life. I'm still going to be a professor. I love this job, and I will still do it even if I win a million dollars or, or the jackpot. But. For people, who, uh, for, for people who are playing this in terms of hope, it's like, this is how I'm going to get out of this situation that I'm in. That's a beneficial thing. It's a nice thing in life to have, the, to have a dream and hope. And of course, the other, half, the other half of the commercials in the lottery that aren't emphasizing overwinning, they're emphasizing this dream aspect. It's like, 
what would you do if you had all this money? And so, and we all like to think about it, like I think about all the charity I could do, and you know, it, so that's really cool and it's fun to think about. Uh, so hope and entertainment are kind of both on the same coin. There. But, you know, I haven't seen the reality show for a while about what happens to the lottery winners five years post. Ooh. It, it was a big Frowny deal, face. And, and most of them uh, were in dire straits, so, either because of yeah. financial mismanagement or so, something. So hope on one side, but then what actually happens when you win is generally really tragic. Money goes um, right down the drain. Was that, sorry? Money goes right yeah. down the drain. Well, yes. And um, if you like schadenfreude, if you like the suffering of others, um, read case histories of people who won the lottery. Because they generally end up with uh, a mess. Be uh, just think about it. You're, all of a sudden, you're a millionaire, and your family and friends know that. And don't you think that they're going to change their expectations on you? And most states, almost all of them, require that you not be anonymous and that you come forward and accept your giant check. So there's really, in most states, no way to keep secret that you won. And, um, and all the charities are tracking you down. And oh, by the way, another kind of, if we talk about misleading for the, for the lottery. Um, so if you win this $1.3 million, by the way, you actually don't win the $1.3 million. You win an annuity. A third, in Arizona, you win a 30-year annuity. And so what would, what would a 30-year annuity be for one year, do you think, for 1.3? 1. 1. Wait, do you bring home 1.3 million? It's going to be like, you're going to get like, it's going to be like something like, it's going to be less than $50,000, right? Well, isn't it in Arizona a 30-year tax annuity? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's gross. So after taxes, you're going to get less than that. Now, you can take the lump sum payout. And, and I, uh, uh, so for a $1.3 million lump sum is going to be something like uh, $650,000, something around that. Uh, and of course, they'll take a third of that right off the top to, to pay taxes. So everybody hears you want a million dollars. And you basically want enough to put a really nice down payment on a home in Scottsdale. But that's it, right? You haven't really. Uh, gotten this kind of life-changing money where you're going to be able to put all your friends, kids through school, and you're going to be able to buy them cars, and all the things they're expecting of you. So this is kind of how relationships tumble. And, and of course, um, it's, I don't know, it's kind of trite to say, but, but, but you talk to people who become rich, and, they've, and they will tell you that it didn't actually make them happier in life. It actually created a whole new parcel of problems. And every time I say that, people will say, well, I'll take that challenge. You know, I'll, I, I, I think I can surmount that challenge. I, make me rich, and I won't be the person who, uh, who finds this to be an unhappy experience. But like I say, the reality is that most people do. And many of them end up with, um, just like professionals, um, the people in professional sports, with big million dollar paychecks, and you talk to them uh, a few years later. Most NFL players, five years out of the NFL, basically have no money left. Uh, and that's a fact. And so, and this is a, this is sort of a common occurrence of winning big money that you tend to you tend to go through it more quickly than you, than you, you think you should. Uh, and um, and then on top of that, all these all these sort of relationship changes. Because really, happiness in life, a lot of it is about the relationships you have in life. And here's a good way to ruin your relationships: family relationships, personal relationships. And that's not something that people anticipate. They're thinking of the big boat they're going to buy, but not the fact that their friends are going to be um, envious and, um, and mad at them for not for buying the boat instead of helping out with it, fix their, you know, my roof you needs fixing. Why didn't you help me with that? So, um, so that's definitely a frowny face idea. Anything else? Yeah. So how much of the positives and the negatives should the state be weighing ethically? Ah. So anybody, what do you think? What do you think about this? What, how much of the positives and the, and the negatives should the state be weighing uh, when they're considering this? I'm going to say they don't weigh any of it right now. They are just, they are more addicted than the most addicted pick six player. The state, and that, uh, somebody initially raised the question, you did, right? Could the state back out now? It's, it would be so hard because they're addicted to the, to the, uh, to the revenue. Yes, sir. The, prob the problem with that, that question, even with that question, is that it assumes that the state is a single logical actor that thinks Correct. and can reason, whereas it really is a, uh, 
a political process, of, you know, within the legislature and the lobbyists, you know, it's um, being decided on all sorts of reasons, very few right. of which have anything to do with ethics. None of none of which have to do anything with ethics. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I had, in one of my uh, executive MBA classes, I actually had a state legislator, um, current state legislator, and we talked about this as a case example in class. And he, at, his mouth just dropped while he through this discussion. And afterwards, he came up to me and he said, "I'm going to do something about this." And of course, he's not going to be able to do anything about this because this thing has a momentum that's unchangeable. That's un. Uh, that, that, that a single legislature with the right idea isn't going to be legislator isn't going to be able to change this because the state is dependent upon this. And what's the alternative? The alternative is we either cut a whole bunch of services or we raise taxes, uh, and um, you know how that's going to how likely to that happening. Yeah, just, just a comment. Uh, I remember I don't remember what the decade was, but when this thing was first talked about, and it was some kind of uh, popular vote, and most of the money for voting for it came from some company back east that was going to get the computer contract and the ticket printing contract and all that. Yeah. And I think it was a relatively narrow margin, but it actually did go through. And now again, my question is, after you factor in all the costs, how much does the state actually get percentage-wise? Like well, I think you might have missed my, my earlier slide on that, but um, let me just sort of throw it up again so you can see it. OK. so. Uh, it, in last year, the, the gross revenue was $70 billion across the country in the states. Uh, this is after expenses and after payouts. So this is just money. This is like tax money coming into the uh, state budget, uh, $20 billion. And I also showed that. That's it, That's all you asked. And, that, and as an equivalency, I just showed you that uh, the gross combined revenue for these three sports is $24 billion. So that's to show you. This is a big number we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, I was just going to say, as far as like the state's cutting it, like there's two political philosophies currently in our country where it's from consequentialist to uh, totalitarianism, and both of them would agree that the lottery is best because totalitarian would be like, well, we're providing all these services. Consequentialist is like anything bad that happens to the people that buy the lottery tickets, that's on them. They chose to do this. Yeah. And uh, I talked about those, those t two anti-lottery uh, sentiments that killed the lottery for 70 years in our country. The fact that people felt it was unfair that others were, were kind of cheating the Puritan work ethic and that also people were being exploited. And guess what? Those are basically the two arguments that people make nowadays and really get nowhere with uh, against the lottery. That it's exploitive of people and that it just seems like it's unfair. And so, um, and, and um, and both of them are easily argued if you say people, this is a voluntary, like my friend Matthias did, he says it's voluntary. Uh, and so they don't have to pay this tax if they don't want to. They don't have to be exploited if they don't want to be. And yet, in the early days, that early New Hampshire lottery, in those early New York lottery, the early Massachusetts lottery, they weren't promoting it at all. They were just offering it. To, and, and then, as the states become more and more addicted to the revenue, then they have to promote it. And they have to promote it heavily. Like I said at the beginning of this discussion, uh, if you think about the, if uh, she's keeping up with me, thank you. So, if you think about the main message you get from the state government every day, I think about any messages we get from the state government that they actually put a lot of marketing money into. I mean, maybe wearing your seatbelts and maybe not drinking and driving, but really the predominant message you're getting from the state government is to buy lottery tickets. That's a, to gamble, to take a chance, to try to improve your life through through winning a lottery. That's the main message we're getting from the state government. And I and I. So I like to hold the state to a higher standard in this regard. Like, there's some states that run some sins, some, t some sin industries. Uh, uh, New Hampshire, I think, uh, has a monopoly on the liquor industry. But you don't go to New Hampshire and hear them pr promoting drinking. They, you don't hear advertisements every day, uh, please drink more, drink more, drink more. You don't hear that, right? They basically just offer it. Which is, how, which is the old style of how the states used to do lotteries. But now, as I say, so we're addicted to them. I mean, imagine the state stops advertising the lottery. Is that going to change the numbers? It w well, of course it will. Otherwise, I mean, just sort of practically speaking, <laughs> any time there's big marketing money spent, and you have to say, if they stop spending that money, would it change buying behavior? And um, I'm going to say just that practically it has to. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending all that money. So I'm working backwards from the, on the question uh, and saying, yeah, that it definitely, it definitely promotes 
more gambling. Um, and and it, it, but so another, we're almost out of time, by the way. Um, four more minutes, but um, now we've played 2,000 years, and we've got a net loss of $175,000. Yeah? I think another interesting question that we, I guess, don't know is that what would these people, I don't play the lottery, but what would people that played a lottery do if they didn't play the lottery? Yeah, well, you were kind of getting at that, right? It's like, where, where's your entertainment dollar going but it provides, otherwise? It probably more than that, so it provides excitement, this kind of idea. They could do other things that is worse, well, sort of drugs or whatnot, right, in some sense. I don't, that might be, I'm not sure about the logic behind that, that particular argument, but, the, but uh, let's, uh, here's another take on your exact question. What if the state wasn't running the lottery, but, but all these games were still available? And, and that, so that's, to me, that's an interesting solution to part of the problems I'm talking about, that if, what if the state got out of the lottery game, uh, turned it over to private industry, still taxed it so that they could still get the revenue, and yet could play their traditional and, and really legitimate role of being a regulator rather than a purveyor of, of this game. And then, by the way, then you could have, you could have the, all the benefits of competition that we don't have now because states are monopolies when they run these games. And so we could have, we, uh, we could have com competition among game providers for payouts. And the state could monitor whether the marketing was exploitive. And we could have interesting der derivations on games, like a game that they have in South Africa where people buy a ticket and half the ticket price goes into a savings account for them. And so you could actually promote savings among people who are going to play anyway. Uh, through really interesting games. Most of, the, most of those style games are illegal in this country or, or not used by the states. Yes? So we like banned advertising for smoking, right? Wh which will never happen if the state's running it, right? So the state can't step back and say, wait a second, you guys are going overboard with this, right? Like, can't the same ethics behind the like, public push to ban advertising for smoking be applied to gambling in state lotteries? I'm going to. So potentially, theoretically, yes, but but most like well, part of why I think, and I, as I introduced this subject, part of why it's so interesting to me is just it's a background noise uh, thing now that we don't think of it in terms of the like smoking is pretty evidently dangerous to people, and we don't think about the harm that the lottery is causing because it's just omnipresent. It's ubiquitous. It's always there. It's in the background. We're hearing commercials about it all day long. We're just so accustomed to it now. It's no longer a, a, it's no longer a thing. And so I don't think you're ever going to have um, you're going to have an I don't think you'll ever have the organized push that you did with with um, with the cigarettes industry. Uh, so you might add to the positive thing the least of uh, other evils. The least of other evils. Well, yeah. yeah. That that was yeah. Um, and now we've run out of time. So, um, well, let me just stop by saying this is what a case-based reasoning does. It's a, taking a, a situation that's real life, concrete, and sort of uh, instead, of, instead of starting with the ethical principles, trying to draw out the ethical considerations from digging into it deeper. So you just went through that. It was fun. And uh, you can do that more in your life. Okay, thanks. Thank you.